the conscious mind is the creative mind. It's the one that has your personal identity into it. It does the, the, the real thinking. And then there's a subconscious mind. Well, there's no entity in it. The subconscious mind is equivalent of a tape player. It records behaviors, and then at the push of a button, plays a behavior. It's automatic. It's a very convenient thing, because then we don't have to relearn all the time. Once you know it, you can make a pattern. The problem is that the basic patterns of belief and behavior that are programmed in the subconscious mind came from our teachers, primarily our parents, our family, and our community. So most people don't even understand how easily we're influenced by our environment. Every person that we encounter, every single situation that we're faced with, every little word that's said on television may not seem too influential to our, to our conscious minds, but your unconscious is designed specifically to let every environmental signal influence you without your awareness. So the question is, are we leading conscious or unconscious lives? And now neuroscience has told us in the unfolding of our lives, only 5% of our life is controlled by our conscious mind and 95% of the time controlled by the subconscious with programs from other people that were installed in there. And the problem is, it means when those programs are playing, we don't see them. And the skeptics will sit there and say, consciousness, archetypes, astrology? No, no, no. We, we create things with our hands, not our minds. Archetypes aren't physical. They can't influence me. But when you think of the fact that we're only conscious of this small little fraction of our behavior, what we don't realize is that entire countries, entire civilizations that think they're free and independent, but are unconsciously too afraid to be free and independent, they will beg to be governed. And if they can't do it themselves, who do you think will consciously or unconsciously take that responsibility? It usually ends up being that strong, masculine, animus archetypal figure. When we think we're in danger, we're not looking for our mother to nurture us. We want our father to protect us. And right on cue with the age of fear, this age of catastrophe, the age of this parasite, we see masculine domination. And one of the primary conduits for giving our responsibility and our conscious energy away is money. We surely don't want to admit that our dependency on money is flawed because that would imply that the fault is our own. And God forbid we take responsibility for our lives, so we blame the money. This is the cornerstone of the entire illusion being built around us by the false ego. Money is said to be the root of all evil, yet it cannot be evil because money is only a symbol. Symbols carry only the faith and spirit of the observer. This means that the symbol of paper money evokes and surfaces the evil intentions and inherent flaw of our false ego. Money only exists because we agree to accept it as valuable. And to further illustrate our incapacity for freedom, we've given the control of our faith-based money to a private corporation instead of the federal government. There is no law stating that we have to use Federal Reserve notes as currency. We choose to because we fear the alternative. Independence. But it's not even really about money, it's about energy, because money is simply this material thing that allows billions of people to crave just one thing and put their energy into the same thing. It's not the plasma TV or the house or the lifestyle or the job or the significant other or the status that we're really after, because we know that we're empty. These people feel sadness and loneliness and void just like anybody else. And they either want to fill that void with materialism because they think that that will make them feel better or they want to sedate the void feeling with material possession. So it all comes back to this feeling of having to put our dependency into an external source, something that we have absolutely no control over. What we're seeing right now is with all the competition of each other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game. Every one of those moves is destructive, not just of the planet, but of human civilization, because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with the extinction that lies before us. You see, we all have 
demons, so to speak. We all have inner demons in our lives, but we expect to see devilish monsters or dark apparitions when you think of a demon, kind of like what you'd see in the cinema. But our demons are really the people in our everyday lives, the people that we argue with, the people that we envy or hate, uh, the ones we physically or emotionally harm in some way, shape, or form. And it's not because we envy or hate qualities in these specific people as much as we hate the fact that they remind us of ourselves. They reflect qualities about ourselves that we wish we had more of or that we wish we didn't have at all. So what do we do? We alleviate that pain not by fixing or fighting our own demons, but by harming the people that remind us of our demons. By harming the people that remind us of the things that we don't like about ourselves. And when we become frustrated that we're not in control of our emotions because we don't really know what's affecting our emotions, we take it out on others. We take it out on absolutely anything else that can show us or act as a catalyst for our hatred. And so we do the same thing to animals. Animals are perfect because they can't defend themselves. It's a perfect catalyst for our inner aggression, our confusion, our hatred. Just take it out on something absolutely helpless. Just imagine how unconscious a person has to be of his or her actions to torture or mutilate or brutalize any living thing. Goats down, and, and he'll be here, and we can. Ouch! God! Oh, yeah. Bit you. Bit of his tail. Is it calling in with their kids? Maybe. He's a big yeah, guy. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a real. Think of the lack of compassion you must have towards life in general to be able to feel no semblance of sympathy towards entire populations, let alone just individuals or individual animals. Entire populations of species that are bred specifically for the purpose of commodity. But I'll tell you what's even more dangerous is not so much the people carrying out this cruelty because that's already been established. That form of hatred and cruelty has already been established and it's already known. What I'm really worried about is the people who are against inhumanity, the people who are against animal cruelty and feel self-righteous enough to think that it's justified to inflict harm or even wish harm on these people. Because those are the people who take unconscious cruel behavior to a whole new level of conscious cruel behavior that's perfectly acceptable in their minds because they feel that it's their job to bring other people to justice, like they're an authority figure of some sort. Those are the people who will have a much harder time figuring out why they harbor so much inner hatred and resentment. They don't seem to realize that it's just another form of the same exact hatred. So to keep from facing our inner demons consistently, what do we do? When we begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's not alright to inflict harm on any other living thing, then the ego has to come up with a more esoteric form of cruelty to trick us into displaying the same form of self-hatred, the same indignant attitude, but just in another way and towards another group of people. But the emptiness will always find a way back in, and people will always start to feel restless again, no matter how many times they transfer blame to yet another person or yet another group. We need chaos in our lives. We crave destruction. We beg for catastrophe. Because if we don't have these things, to act as a form of exorcism or a catalyst for us, we start to notice these things in ourselves, and that's what we don't want. You see, we can deal with wars, we can deal with terrorism, we can deal with stock market collapse and economic collapse, we can deal with these things. But once we start to notice this chaos within ourselves, that's what we're really afraid of. We'll take a million September 11ths over one moment of true insight towards our self-hate.